Today on the Deerskin Diary, we are going to explore one culinary moment in Daniel Boone's life involving a wild turkey, as well as look at the wild turkey as a mainstay and a lifesaver for others. So stick around. There's bound to be a morsel in here that you're going to want to chew on. But first, I need to set up camp. In 1783, Anthony Stokes was a provincial judge in the colony of Georgia, and he wrote of those moving into Georgia from Virginia and North Carolina that when these people are routed in the other provinces, they fly to Georgia where the winters are mild and the man who has a rifle, ammunition, and a blanket can subsist in that vagrant way which the Indians pursue. For the quantity of deer, wild turkeys, and other game there affords subsistence and the country being mostly covered in woods, they have it always in their power to construct temporary huts and procure fuel. In talking about the life of frontiersman, John S. C. Abbott describes a lone hunter's camp as, quote, in an unknown region and surrounded with dangers, he is the sentinel of his own safety and relies on himself for protection. The toilsome march of the day being ended, at the fall of night, he seeks for safety some narrow, sequestered hollow, and by the side of a large log builds a fire, and after eating a coarse and scanty meal, wraps himself up in his blanket and lays himself down for repose on his bed of leaves, with his feet to the fire, hoping for favorable dreams, ominous of future good luck, while his faithful dog and gun rest by his side. Turkeys were a common food source according to the written record. They were abundant and easy game to fill the pot or occupy the spit, and accounts of huge flocks of the birds were common descriptors in the area that became known as Kentucky and the middle ground to its north. As a game animal and a cast of frontier culinary characters, the turkey almost always makes an appearance and is, in my opinion, as synonymous with the frontier as the white-tailed deer and the black bear. Archaeological evidence even confirms this at the Fort Chiswell site in Virginia, where wild turkey bones represent a significant component of protein sources recovered during the archaeological dig. One frontiersman, though, was a turkey connoisseur. Daniel Boone had a lifelong relationship with the wild bird as both a hunter and a provider. Daniel Morgan in his best-selling uh, biography of Boone describes a scene where as a young man Boone goes out with his mother and uh, his mother finds him later cooking a turkey over a makeshift spit using a piece of curved bark to catch the bastings and baste the turkey and when she asked him where he learned that, he said that he learned it from the Native Americans. Now the details in this story I, I, I find fascinating, right? Here we have a young Daniel Boone who's out. He's a hunter and a provider by shooting this turkey for his mother and then cooking it. And he's not only cooking it, but he utilizes a method that was taught to him by local Native tribes. And it begs the question, right? Like, where did Boone learn this stuff from? And it gives us a little glimpse back into Daniel Boone's life about uh, the beginnings of this great frontiersman that we all know so well today. As picturesque as this camp and this scene may appear today, oftentimes these wild turkeys themselves were sought after as emergency food sources. Again, we turn to John S. C. Abbott, who wrote that his situation did not afford him much time for contemplation. He was in exile from warm clothing and plentiful mansions of society. His homely woodsman's dress soon became old and ragged, and the cravings of hunger compelled him to sustain from day to day the fatigues of the chase. Often he had to eat his venison, bear's meat, or wild turkey without bread or salt. Joseph Doddridge mentioned that, quote, my father's family was small and he took us all with him. The Indian meal which he brought was expended six weeks too soon so that for the length of time we had to live without bread. The lean venison and the breast of wild turkeys we were taught to call bread. In 1778, Boone is out with other settlers near Blue Licks, Kentucky making salt and he's captured by the Shawnee. He's taken back to the town of Old Chillicothe, which is in modern-day Ohio, and he's informed that the Shawnee intend to attack Boonesboro. Now, Boone spends the winter there 
before eventually making his escape and traveling for five days to the wilderness to get back to Boonesboro to warn the citizens that the Shawnee are going to attack. During that five day odyssey back to Boonesboro, he stops to eat only once. And the animal that he hunts is the wild turkey. Then for the first time, he's so far indulged in a feeling of security as to venture to shoot a turkey and kindling a fire, he feasted abundantly upon the rich repast. It was the only meal in which he indulged during the flight of five days. Boone went on to successfully warn the settlement and eventually repel the attack. But for my purposes today, I'm in no hurry. So one of the hardest parts about cooking such a large piece of meat over a fire like this is that some of the meat will be overdone while other parts of the interior may be almost close to raw. So it's really a matter of even temperature control and really trying hard to uh, keep this over a low and even enough heat over a long amount of time to get everything done as close as possible. Now, I would imagine that if you were a starving frontiersman and you finally killed uh, a turkey like this and you had it cooking, that you weren't willing to wait four or five hours to, uh, to get this thing completely perfectly done. So I would imagine a lot of times some of these turkeys were cut up and put in the stew pot or cooked um, in, in pieces and literally eaten piecemeal. As a piece was done, it was eaten, and then you continue to cook the others. Jonathan Carver, in his travels through the interior part of North America, described the Nottawessies, a tribe who live just west of the Mississippi River, as, quote, when they roast, if it is a large joint or a whole animal, such as a beaver, they fix it as the Europeans do, on a spit made of hardwood, and placing the ends onto forked props, now and then turn it. And that's how I've chosen to make this bird today. I have a curved piece of poplar bark here that I'm using to catch the meager drippings from the turkey occasionally and then turn around and baste it with. I don't know exactly how Boone would have done this. There's no real written record to describe it, but this is how I've interpreted it and it's working pretty well. So here it is, the uh, wild turkey cooked over the open campfire. It took a little bit of time to get everything just done, but let's see how it is. Mmm. Done just about perfect. Still some moisture in there. The smoke flavor from the campfire really permeates through. And some of that moisture from the bastings really seems to have uh, worked out well for us. All in all, I'd say I'd do this again over a campfire anytime. You just gotta make sure you have the right amount of time. The wild turkey, this quintessential American bird cooked over a fire um, using a, a documented native technique and then utilizing Boone's story itself. Um, just wood smoke and uh, some even heat, a makeshift spit, and the flavor of the turkey itself. Phenomenal project. I'm really glad I did this. And uh, I've got a turkey to finish. So we'll see you next time on the Deerskin Diary.